The graduation address gives us the opportunity to hear from a distinguished member of our alumni community. And we're very fortunate today that the address will be delivered by Dr. Susan White. Dr. White completed her medical training with Monash University, Prince Henry's Hospital and Monash Medical Centre. She was part of the first intake of registrars into the newly confirmed specialty of sports and exercise medicine. Now at Olympic Park for over 20 years, Dr. White has supported elite Australian athletes in numerous international, Commonwealth and Olympic competitions and has been a member of the Australian Olympic Committee Medical Commission for a number of years. In 1999, Dr. White joined the Australian Sports Drug Medical Advisory Committee and became its chair in 2014. She serves on international committees engaged in anti-doping and therapeutic use issues and sits on many tribunals to consider violations. Last year, Dr. White was appointed as a fellow of Monash University. And I now have much pleasure in inviting Dr. Susan White to deliver this afternoon's graduation address. Dr. White. Chancellor, Mr. Simon McKeon, Senior Vice Provost, Professor Pauline Nestor, members of the faculty, ladies and gentlemen, and especially the new graduates. Congratulations. I'm sure you're all proud and excited and probably a little relieved that your studies are finished, at least for now. But I'm here to talk to you about what's next. I don't remember who spoke at my graduation 28 years ago, and I don't expect you'll remember me, but I hope you remember a little about what I'm going to say. I don't intend to give you advice on your clinical or academic careers, but I will share with you the thing that made a huge difference to mine. I said yes. This is indeed a popular answer to a topical question, but it isn't what I'm going to talk about. Instead, I've looked back at my varied experiences, achievements, and certainly my mistakes, and some of the best outcomes were because I said yes. Often when it was inconvenient, and I wasn't sure if I was even capable of doing what was asked. It all began many years ago. I was a second year resident pottering along at Monash Medical Center, tossing up between intensive care and rheumatology as a future career. When a somewhat infamous sports doctor, Peter Bruckner, who you may have seen roving the boundaries at the football, rang and asked if I was interested in coming to Olympic Park Sports Medicine Center. I had done my fifth year elective there, so it had a little taste of what it was about. He needed me for a year because he wanted to write a book. Most of my hospital consultants, when I discussed this choice with them, said I was crazy. They said sports medicine wasn't a career. I'd be a glorified physio, which I think they thought was horrific, but I thought sounded rather fun. They all said it wouldn't last, but I thought it was, sounded pretty interesting for at least for 12 months. I had no idea about sports medicine, but I still said yes. Six months into my first year at Olympic Park, the Barcelona Olympics and Paralympics were only two months away. Intellectually disabled Paralympic athletes were going to compete for the first time. Unfortunately, their doctor became unwell at the last minute. And everyone who knew anything about sports medicine was already committed to the Olympic teams or AFL or rugby league. But I was new and available so they asked me. I had never travelled with a team. I had no idea what I was doing. I was still working out what to do with a sprained ankle. But I said, yes, why not? Then I panicked. As it turned out, it was the hardest trip that I have ever done, and I've done a lot. There were 60 athletes, all with a mild to moderate intellectual disability. It was like going on grade six camp, except they were all much bigger and had very adult hormones. I spent the trip dealing with some fairly major medical issues like status epilepticus on a bus between the village and venue with a bus driver who, when we asked him to stop, please, only spoken word was manana, which I believe with my limited Spanish means later. We did try to explain to him that stopping the bus now would have been good. We had a mass gastro outbreak that involved moving the whole team from the communal living residences into a monastery in the countryside. I had to work out how to prevent unexpected Paralympic pregnancies, 
We did consider sprinkling the pill on the cornflakes, but decided against it, particularly as we were now, have, now living in a monastery and the nuns were serving breakfast. <laughs> I had to fill drink bottles, carry kit bags and literally cut up oranges, but I met some amazing people and witnessed some equally amazing athletic performances and was paid in thanks only. I returned exhausted, but decided this is what I wanted to do and waved goodbye to hospital medicine. Because of this experience, I was then asked to be involved in interle international intellectually disabled sport, and from there I was asked to coordinate the medical side of Paralympic sport in Australia. This was in the lead into to the 96 Paralympics in Atlanta. I had secretly been hoping to go with the rowers to the Olympics, but was told by one of the senior rowing doctors that I was too young and too female to do the job. How times have changed, I hope. So I said yes to the Paralympic role. This trip involved almost 200 athletes who in the lead into the games were base camped around the southern USA. I spent two weeks driving on my own to different team camps, listening to gospel music and sermons on the radio. I was given the first gun I had ever touched to carry with me as Atlanta had the highest rate of gun murders in the States. Thankfully, there were no shootings, either accidentally myself or any would-be murderers but I was the only doctor, so there was no sleep, not much food, and again, no money. But we won the wheelchair basketball gold medal and the fireworks at the closing ceremony, as per Juan Antonio Samaranch, were the best ever. In 1999, Australia established the world's first national anti-doping medical committee. It was called ASMAC. They needed someone with Paralympic experience to be part of the group. However, at the time, I was seven months pregnant with baby number two, and baby number one was only 11 months old. I felt overwhelmed and I knew very little about drugs in sport. But again, I said yes. There was a grand formal induction in Canberra with federal ministers, heads of the Institute of Sport and many politicians. I attended with a two-week-old tucked under my arm discreetly. Over the next few months, this baby went to Canberra more times than a politician and was babysat by scientists at the Secure Drug Testing Lab in Sydney who had no idea what a baby was. And I had a very steep learning curve in the world of anti-doping. In 2013, a famous Australian cricketer took a pill that his mother gave him to help him with his expanding waistline. He then gave a urine sample to an Asada drug tester and it came back positive. Surprise, surprise. There was a tribunal to decide his fate. By this stage, baby number three was a few months old. I had done all of Cricket Australia's tribunals in the previous years and they were keen to keep the team together for what was going to be a very high profile case. Three kids work in a media circus. I wasn't sure, but I said yes. The tribunal went ahead. We adjourned every two hours for young Tom to be fed and the decision and appeal had to work around the needs of a hungry four month old. I have to say much credit to Cricket Australia and all involved. As some of you may or may not remember, it was the same week that Kirsty Marshall, an ex-Australian skier turned politician, was booted from Parliament for breastfeeding her own son during question time. In 2007, the World Championships for Swimming were held in Melbourne. Swimming Australia asked if I would consider providing the medical coverage for the team. I was reluctant as I felt my team travelling days were over, but I did say yes and there were some extra duties that some may consider bonuses, one of which was to assist the swimmers into their very tight swimsuits. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> but the bonus result was an offer to join FINA, which is International Swimming's anti-doping board, with some of the best anti-doping scientists in the world. In 2016, the Russians and the Rio Olympics collided. I was still on FINA's doping board at the time, and for the first time, our group was the one that stood up and said no to the Russians. Unfortunately, FINA wasn't as brave as their own group of doctors and scientists, and possibly not as ethical. I don't think this is being taped, is it, <laughs> that I said that? They bowed to pressure and let the Russians compete. I resigned in protest to threats and innuendo, which led to much publicity, particularly internationally. Since this, it seems the world's sporting community is finally starting to stand up to the Russians and many others, and the times are changing, we hope. So on rereading this speech, I realise the inadvertent message of this story is something a wise old doctor said to me one day. There is never a good time to have a baby, so just have one.
But I hope the real message of this story is that it is often inconvenient, daunting and indeed financially unrewarding to say yes, but that saying yes can create experiences and opportunities that you could not imagine at the time and lead you down paths you didn't see coming. In your futures, I hope you consider saying yes when opportunities arise, even if they don't seem glamorous or exciting or even manageable, so that you too experience some of the unexpected highlights in life and hopefully it will also mean that when you finally say no, someone listens. Thank you.